All right, so admittedly, building a switching power supply on a breadboard, not usually the best idea. Uh, you're not going to get the kind of re reliability and uh, signal integrity that you would expect to get from this power supply. Um, yeah, hopefully this will work. Uh, it's probably going to be a little bit finicky. You can even see I did something silly there and left a lot of my wires long. Uh, you don't want these kind of long like this. Uh, or in here, these antenna leads, uh, because you have high current paths running through there that's at relatively high frequency, being about 30 kilohertz, uh, it's not going to be super stable here on the breadboard, but hopefully it'll be stable enough to uh, play around with. Um, so, one thing that uh, I'm going to have to do, even after I uh, build this up here and test it on the breadboard, I'm probably going to have to design a small PCB and lay this out on the PCB, test it in that environment. Basically in the final configuration I expect to use in the Nixie Tube clock. Because, yeah, we're trying it out here on the breadboard and it should work, but with the kind of characteristics that you have here, like with these long leads and the high capacitance of the pins, or the, the sockets inside the breadboard rather, uh, you're not going to get a really good idea about how this thing's going to behave when it's actually on the circuit board itself. So uh, if you're really serious about your switch mode power supply, and you should be, uh, you know, something a larger company would do is they would build this up uh, as they'd expect to use it. Of course, it would be on the final board most likely, but uh, they would build it up as they expect to use it, do a lot of development testing on it. They would do EMC compliance testing on it, make sure it didn't uh, uh, emit too much noise or be victim to too much noise. Um, typically it's going to be emitting noise. But, you know, it's, I don't want to go to the expense and time and effort to do that. So I'll make a small board that's basically just the power supply and uh, we'll test that out. But for now, uh, we're going to test right on the breadboard. Uh, one thing I did, by the way, this uh, heat sink I put on there, I really don't think I'm going to need it. I chose a MOSFET with a relatively low RDS on, uh, so that's the drain source resistance uh, as it's turned on all the way, and that's a low value. That's where you would normally see your power dissipation, because it would be uh, the current running through that transistor times the resistance uh, that you would see in the on state. It's in the order of milliohms. So really, you know, there's not going to be a whole lot, even at one and a half amps running through that thing peak, there's not going to be a whole lot of uh, heat generated. Uh, so I'll just go over the basic topology here. Here we have our 1000 microfarad bulk input capacitor. There's our main inductor, of course. Big beast, it's got to handle 1.5 amps peak. Uh, we have that 180 back here, ohm, which protects the uh, collector on the uh, transistor inside the chip. There's our 0.2 ohm shunt resistor there. Obviously the uh, MC34063A chip down in there. Uh, here is the 330 ohm resistor that we have on the base of the uh, transistor to ground. We also have our, let's see if I can get my finger in there, this little tiny capacitor there is our timing capacitor that gives us our 30 kilohertz. Then we have uh, that going to our main switching transistor there, the MOSFET, uh, output of which goes to our main uh, diode here. And that diode goes to our bulk output capacitance here. Uh, it's tapped off of there through our voltage divider, our 220K and our 1K resistor to ground, the center of which goes back to the feedback pin on our uh, little chip there. So, as you can see over here, I've already got my DC load set for the 30 milliamps that we expect to uh, want to sink here. And yeah, it's 17 degrees C. It's rather cold in my basement right now, even though it's something like 65 degrees outside. Just doesn't seem to ever want to warm up in here. Anyway, uh, I've got my power supply set. Let's go ahead and hit the power button and see what happens. Whoa! Wow! The voltage went way up. It went up to about 300 volts, and I gotta be careful because 
this uh, diode isn't rated for 300. This cap, uh, yeah, there you go, 450, that'd be okay, but I believe this diode is not rated for that, so I'm not sure what's going on. Maybe I had something shorted. Uh, oh, silly me. Look at my load. Look in the bottom right there. Off. I haven't turned it on yet, so let me hit the switch to turn it on. Try that again. We'll watch our voltage. There we go. See, it just wasn't under load. To have no load on a switching power supply at all, uh, that's not really the way these things are meant to run. And certain ones, especially unstable ones like this, uh, they do not run happily without any kind of load. So uh, what was happening is it just kept charging this capacitor and it had no way to bleed that off. And uh, even though it had the, you've got to be careful, we've got 215 volts there, even though we had this voltage divider here, which should tell the chip to turn that transistor off, um, it was still operating um, in what's called discontinuous mode, where the inductor uh, actually discharges for a certain period of time. We won't go into that too much, but uh, yeah, without a load, it runs in discontinuous mode. With a load, uh, it's more likely to run in continuous mode, so obviously we had gone discontinuous. Our voltage spiked up, but now that there we are, uh, right around that 200 volts, a little bit high, like I said, because of that fudge factor in the resistors. I didn't use exactly the value uh, that I had calculated. I went a little bit high, but that's okay, because higher is actually a little bit better. Um, it's going to drop a little bit more power in the uh, series resistor on the plate of the Nixie tube, but... Uh, as you already know, I've decided to run them a little bit harder. Uh, instead of running them at 20 milliamps total, I'm going to run them all at 30 milliamps. Well, combined, 30 milliamps. You know, so uh, whatever that works out to be per tube. I'm too lazy. I'm tired. Uh, I got a sinus headache from the, uh, the weather. I, I don't really feel like calculating that. Uh, so that's going to run it harder, and what that's going to do is it's going to add a little bit of a blue glow uh, to our Nixie tubes, which I like. That's the mercury glowing when that happens. Anyway, you can see there we are, 215 volts, um, just under 30 milliamps there. Oh, there you go. Hit 30 for a second. And that's about 6.3 watts we're delivering uh, to this load here. And you can see we already went up by one degree. There's that weird anomaly you probably just saw that happens occasionally. I tracked that down to the ADC and it seems to be an analog devices thing. It's the part. I replaced the part, I went through my code, and uh, every once in a while that chip will just, the output will just go high and stay high uh, for a good two or three seconds. So, you know, I could fudge something into my code to make that okay, but you know, I just haven't gone to the effort yet. I don't care about it that much. It doesn't bother me. Like I said, it's just the ADC, so it's not effect affecting the actual load. The load stays constant, it's just not reading it correctly. Uh, and here you go, you can see this is our output. We've got it set to about 12 volts there. A little bit of parallax. Uh, can't really see there. I can see myself. Hi. See me? Uh, anyway. Uh, and it's drawing about three quarters of an amp. So, yeah, you know, there's 12 volts, three quarters of an amp. Uh, so you're looking at about eight watts being drawn on the input side. And then only about, uh, we'll say, six and a quarter watts being delivered to the load. So, what efficiency does that give us? Let's look up on the calculator here. So we've got 0.625. I'm sorry. 6.25 divided by, in my own light here, uh, what did we say? 8. So we're getting about, jeez, can't get the light there. We're getting about 78% efficiency uh, out of that, which isn't bad. Um, actually, that's a lot better than what I would have expected out of this switching converter in this strange configuration we have it. No real good filtering, and uh, yeah, that's not bad actually. I'm, I'm happy with that. Let's see what we can see as far as AC. Are we getting a ton of ripple? No. 
that's not bad. 11 millivolts RMS. That's not bad at all. Uh, let's hook up the scope and uh, we'll see what the actual waveforms look like. Alright, so I am probing the output now. And sorry, uh, the fans that I have going are probably really loud by now. I have fans on my load, I have fans on my power supply, there's a fan on my oscilloscope, so those are probably generating quite a bit of background noise, so apologize for that. But uh, I am directly on the output now, and uh, I've got DC coupling. You can see that we're at about 500 millivolts per division, and uh, let me go in a little bit closer here to see if that's might be blurry for you. Is that any better? I don't know. Hard to tell on my little LCD screen. Anyhow, uh, so yeah, 500 millivolts per division. We're getting maybe about one volt peak to peak there uh, on the ripple. Maybe not as nice as I'd like to see it, but uh, yeah, you know, it's... Uh, when, when you look at the average on the meter, you could see that we had, what, 10 millivolts RMS? So it can really lie to you based on the distance that you have between uh, those pulses there. And I can single shot capture that. Hello? Let me try to force the trigger here. Ah, there we go. Uh, you can see that they're short pulses and there's a huge distance between them. That's why that RMS value dropped really low even though we're getting uh, about one volt, one volt uh, spikes on that. So yeah, that's not the greatest, uh, but you know, in reality, uh, we're going to be using this power supply just as the high voltage power Nixie tube. So I, I really don't care that it has a one volt spike in there. Uh, if there were something bigger, you know, if we had five or 10 volt spikes, then I'd really kind of worry about it because that could really start introducing noises noise in other parts of the circuit that we don't want. You know, we certainly don't want that in our microcontroller. We don't want that in our clock lines or in our I2C. So, uh, you know, hopefully this isn't a big issue. Uh, if we have to, we can go to a larger output capacitance or maybe uh, add an inductor in there to uh, quiet that down. But I'm reasonably happy with that. That's not too bad. Uh, so let me switch here, put it back and run. Uh, I'm going to go upstream of that diode and it's going to go absolutely crazy because these pulses are going to be much much bigger sorry going the wrong way there there we go that's a hundred volts per division <laughs> you can see uh, obviously a lot bigger let me move that down here so we can get a better look at it there's 50 volts per division as you would expect um, it's having trouble triggering on that. That's the PWM because this thing is constantly changing duty uh, in order to uh, you know, change the output as the load changes. Obviously the load isn't changing but it's a, it's a dynamic feedback loop so it's constantly changing to maintain uh, that output at the current that we're drawing. So that's why it's jumping all over the place like a jackrabbit. Uh, so let me single shot capture that. And you can see that's what our actual pulse looks like. Whoops, wrong way. Try that again. If I can actually zoom in on a pulse here. That's pretty clean. That's not bad. It's not bad at all. Um, so yeah, you can see at 50 volts per division, we got one, two, three, four, maybe a half there. Um, just over 50 volts, or oh, I'm sorry, 200 volts. Um, as you would expect, because we're running at 215 volts right now. Um, so that's the pulse that comes out of that uh, uh, inductor. See, so the inductor goes up, saturates at a point, and then drops back down. Um, you know, as it uh, as the transistor turns back on again. So uh, the only thing is this. Uh, leading edge, the rising edge, is pretty clean, but uh, it's a bit of a... Jeez, uh, I can't find the words I'm looking for here. That's not as steep as I'd like to see on the falling edge, and the reason for that is because the transistor on the MC34063A chip uh, is an open emitter. 
Uh, it does not have the ability to pull that gate on the external transistor back down to ground. So it shuts off much more slowly than, uh, than it turns on. Which for us really isn't a problem. We could add a speed up transistor to the gate of that uh, if we really wanted to fix that problem. But it seems to be working okay for us here. Let me move my probe to something else. Let's take a look at the gate pulse of our MOSFET. Let's see if I can grab that here. Sorry, this is... Alright. Obviously, this is a much smaller signal than our huge output voltage was, so... Let me single shot capture that. Now it's really pronounced. You can see that here is that leading edge again. We get a little bit of overshoot, not too bad. Transistor's on, and whoa, look how shallow that is. It should be much steeper than that. Again, the reason is it can't just shut off. Uh, so, you know, it can compensate for that to some extent. Um, but yeah, that's that's not the greatest, but it's not terrible either. It, it obviously works okay in this instance. Um, if we had any kind of more critical design, uh, we would want to add that speed up transistor to the base, uh, which would essentially just, uh, once the uh, open emitter output on the chip tells the transistor to turn off, that transistor on the base on the gate, I should say, of the uh, MOSFET would just pull that right down to ground. It'd be much steeper. You'd have much cleaner pulses on that. Uh, maybe that's something we'll try. I uh, have to think about that. But uh, anyway, yeah, that's the gate pulse on our external MOSFET there. So, yep. Looks as I would expect. And let's just try one last thing I'm kind of curious about. Let's look at the timing capacitor signal. What does that look like? Put that in frame here. Uh, and you can see, same thing. Let me single shot that. There we go. Aha! Now it looks funny, but that's actually the signal that it shows on the datasheet. So, um, yeah, it's just like the datasheet shows. You've got a ramp up there and then it suddenly increases in steepness and then boom drops back down that is exactly what the data sheet shows so I'm not surprised by that at all okay uh, so well, I hope you found this uh, interesting uh, like I said uh, I think what I'm going to do now is I'll have to lay out a printed circuit board and I'll have to see how it performs on the printed circuit board I'm not going to use the roll components the only reason I did for this instance was uh, I wanted to be able to breadboard it. You know, if I had used surface mount components, it'd be much more difficult, if not impossible, to breadboard. But uh, yeah, I'm actually relatively pleased with our performance. Um, you know, considering this is on a breadboard, it seems relatively stable. Uh, I'm pretty happy with that. I was a little bit surprised, but uh, it's a pleasant surprise. So uh, this maybe this is going to work better off than. Uh, than I thought it would. Anyway, uh, I hope you found that interesting. Um, subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't already done so, and follow me on Twitter at Ohms at Home. We'll see you. All right, I know what you were thinking. Andrew, can it drive a Nixie tube? Because, well, if it can't, it's not very useful, is it? Well, there you go. Driving the Nixie tube, not a problem at all. See ya.